There we go. Okay, so good, e good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for attending tonight's um, presentation on um, bullying presented by mental health um, counselor, Karen Gonzalez with the Bullying and School Violence Advocacy Program. I'm Teresa Query, I'm with the Family Focus Resource Center and I'm the coordinator at the Chatsworth office that's located in the North Lake County Regional Center. Uh, I have put in the um, chat box our website, which I'm sure you may have seen when you signed up for um, this particular workshop. We host many during the year, uh, all types of different workshops. We provide um, resources and support to families of children with disabilities. So please check us out. Our website again is there in the um, um, chat box. I did wanna mention that we will have on October 23rd, a virtual resource fair, the All Abilities Resource Fair from 10 to one on October 23rd. So when you visit our website, you'll see more information on that as well. A uh, reminder, this is being recorded, uh, as I said, and it will be um, put on our website, probably, I would say for sure by the end of the week. If you have any questions during the presentation this evening, um, Karen has said that feel free to write in the chat box um, anytime during her presentation and she'll answer questions. So with that, I will turn it over to Karen. Thank you again so much. I know that people will probably join us uh, a little bit more, but for those that are here, let's make sure that we give them something to, um, to take back with them. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. We are happy to be here and to support and to give the community a good uh, education on bullying and some resources and things that you should know. We know that bullying is a public health concern. Uh, the bullying situation in our schools has gotten to the point where we have kids with uh, anxiety disorders, um, or we have physical ailments that they present, um, suicide ideation, and so we want to give this message of hope that there is support out there. Um, and we're one of the resources that you can call um, to get that support. Um, we are from San Fernando Valley Community Mental Health Center. Um, we are at uh, the phone number 1-866-BE-A-HERO. It's a warm line that you can call us and ask for resources. It's free. Uh, the number is 1-866-232-4376. We also have a large social media platform. Uh, we have a YouTube channel with um, some small um, educational pieces or, or topics of conversation. And you can follow us at hashtag 866BeAHero. Um, we encourage you to join our online community. I'll talk about that a little bit later, but we need to show kids that there are people that care. And one of the ways you can do that is by joining our online community and commenting and participating um, with your comments of hope or interacting with our social media. And you can reach everybody on our team by um, emailing bullying at San Fernando Valley Community Mental Health Center.org. That email goes to everybody so that we don't miss an email um, and that you get the supportive services that you need. Let's see. So this is what we do. First and foremost, all of our services are free. So we don't want uh, finance to be a barrier for you to reach out to us and ask questions. We're also a very friendly team. So call us. Um, we are very compassionate. We want to hear your stories. We want to see how we can help you and, and guide your situation. We work with students from kinder to high school. Um, again, there's that hotline number for us. We also serve as an anonymous reporting center. So if you know somebody's being bullied, but you don't want to be the person that reports it, call us, give us the details, and we will notify the school for you, keeping you anonymous, of course. However, if you are reporting that you're gonna hurt yourself or you're gonna hurt somebody else, or you're reporting some sort of child abuse, then that doesn't become an anonymous report. That becomes uh, potentially a child abuse report or, or whatever needs to happen. But for the most part, the hotline works for you to call us and report somebody might be um, bullied at school and needs that attention. We encourage that phone number for our students. Um, a lot of times our students don't know what to do. And this is one thing that we want students to know is that you can call us, you can stay anonymous, and you're really saving a life when you call and report bullying. 
We provide resources and referrals if necessary. If you need um, therapy services or if you need um, other assistance, um, like we would refer to regional center, we refer to um, other programs if you need uh, specific uh, resources. We do provide presentations like these ones. So um, call us if you want a presentation for your school, um, if you want a presentation for your religious community, if you have a sports group, we are happy to go out and um, have this presentation. We do participate in IEPs. Um, our disabilities community, um, our, our students that have IEPs, for, uh, 504s, um, might need that assistance with making sure that the bullying language or that the safety plans or needs assessment include a social anxiety or um, trouble with socialization or bullying needs. We do do advocacy in person and virtually. Uh, right now, because of COVID, it is virtual unless if there's a need for us to be present. Um, but we do do in-person advocacy. We do do Zoom advocacy. We are one of the only programs that doesn't just offer the resources or the guidance. If the situation calls for us to assist, we will show up with you. Um, we do do consultation. We do consulting for schools, um, for their events, for staff development, or how to improve um, school climate, things like that. We do do consulting for families um, who might need some support or who want to verify a process, um, and we do that. Um, we also partner with our chat program. They offer counseling for zero to 17. Um, most of the children that we counsel or that chat, chat counsels um, are part of the uh, victims of crime. Bullying is considered a crime and you don't need a police report for that. You just have to be suffering from bullying and we link you to that counseling service if needed. If you wanna call them directly, um, there can be reached at counseling at San Fernando Valley Community Mental Health Center org. That's a lot <laughs> to take in. So, um, you know, we have had to work on these bullying definitions and where do they come from and how do we recognize if this is bullying? Um, oftentimes we're not aware that there are laws already in place that let us know what bullying is. And so we look for these three truths. One of them is that it's unwanted. Nobody wants to be bullied. It's not something that kids raise their hand for, that they seek their peers to do. Um, it's something that is imposed on them. So it's an act that is unwanted. We know that bullying has a power and control dynamic. One person has power, the other person feels powerless. Um, if your child is unable to uh, eat lunch in a certain area because they're gonna be bullied, that takes away their power to choose where to have lunch. If your student is unable to make friends because somebody is keeping others away or they're saying rumors about them or they're telling them not to um, be friends with them, that's a power and control dynamic. Um, if uh, the person who is having the bullying behavior is part of the sports at school and your student is not able to participate because of fear of being on the same team, that's a power and control dynamic. When one person is benefiting from the school more than the other because of bullying, that's a power and control dynamic. And of course, these situations happen more than once. So when it, things happen more than once, we might get into a conversation about, is this an incident or is this bullying? An incident is something that happens one time. I may be having a bad day and I push somebody, a teacher sees me, they call my attention, and then I stop my behavior and it doesn't happen again. Bullying is calling you names on Monday, pushing you on Tuesday. The following week, I might tell somebody a rumor about you. Uh, the month later, I might um, continue to call you names. And so we see that there's a pattern of behavior that happens. You're a target um, and it's happening more than once. So when these three things come together, um, we know that the child is suffering through bullying and it gives us an opportunity to talk to the school um, and address these issues to create a plan for the child to be able to go to school um, and be successful uh, academically. So a lot of times they ask us, how do I know if my child's being bullied? My child comes home and they don't tell me anything or they don't, um, they don't share with me that someone's bothering them. So we really have to pay attention to our, our children and, and what changes happen in their behavior or their person um, or um, even in their things. So 
We might notice changes in, in attitude or behavior. Um, they might be sad and depressed. So I might have liked to go to school and now I really don't wanna go. I might have been very outgoing and now I don't feel that way, I feel depressed. Uh, my self-esteem has come down. When our kids have that sadness and that depression, when they feel helpless, when they feel hopeless, we might have them think about suicide ideation. Um, they might really be impacted by feeling like this problem isn't going away, I can't solve it myself and it's really overwhelming, and then they have that hopelessness. Um, so we need to pay attention to that. Um, maybe the thing that they used to enjoy, they don't enjoy anymore. So it's important to um, pay attention to their enjoyment. If they used to like to hang out outside and now they're always inside, uh, maybe they're irritant. Uh, maybe they are irritated by people asking them questions or whatever happened at school that they couldn't react to, they're reacting at home. Um, if I couldn't be upset at school, then I'm going to be upset at home. That can be something that happens. They might be fearful. They might not want to go to school. They might not want to go outside. Um, and then they're hypervigilant. The hypervigilance is um, uh, looking at their phone often, looking at their computer screen often, um, looking at how they dress, uh, looking over their shoulder, not wanting to go into the restroom at school. Um, you know, taking their time with things and that's just being hypervigilant. Um, changes in behaviors like not wanting to go to school, they're more quiet than usual, and maybe there's a change in appetite. So they might be hungry, uh, hungrier or they're not so hungry anymore. So we might look at where they might change uh, typical behaviors. There's signals in the body like bruises or torn clothes, or maybe their property has been lost or broken or stolen. Um, let's look at um, gum in the hair. Uh, let's look at uh, um, scratches or uh, maybe their clothes having a strange mark like it was being cold, things like that. Those are signals that we can look into. Um, and also health changes. Your kid is starting to have a lot of headaches, a lot of stomach aches, um, uh, changes in the appetite or changes in their sleep pattern. Um, these are things that we would be um, looking towards their health. Um, these are also signs that might identify to us that um, something's going on. Um, up until this point, I'm just gonna check chat. Doesn't look like anybody has any questions. Um, and then I'll just keep going. So we are social beings. We are people that need friends. We need that connection. We need to feel we belong to something and that we are accepted. Um, our kids during the pandemic really felt that um, loneliness from not having their peers day to day at recess, chit chatting with them about what they liked um, and being able to uh, connect with friends. Um, and so they turned, they had already an experience with being online, but the online experience increased uh, because they needed that connection. So we found that um, kids were continuing to bully online. Um, a lot of parents ask us what's online. We assume that online is just on the computer and online really is on the phone, on computers, gaming, now your watches and your smart TV. So our, we noticed that our students were interacting more. So um, on the smart TV, they're playing video games online with peers and friends, and they have these uh, prestigious or private uh, gaming going on, and they have to be invited by somebody else. And then we realized that children were being bullied on there. They were being included into a gaming group, and then when they didn't like you, they would exclude you. And then they would tell other kids not to invite them into other groups. So we started seeing um, cyberbullying come about um, in different ways. So um, in that online community and in that being social uh, online, we know that not just the victim was being affected, but we also pay attention to bystanders who witness it and who don't want to be bullied. So they tend to either become perpetrators of bullying or they will um, be afraid to connect or be friends. And so they might isolate um, as well so that they're not being picked on. And while we have kids with bullying behavior, um, you know, our bullies, they need support too. That bullying is coming from somewhere. Um, and so it's important to see kids' behavior as language. What are they trying to tell us with this behavior? 
So our program works with all three. Our program um, knows that all these three individuals that are impacted by bullying need our support. So when we are being bullied, we know that it makes us vulnerable. We know that when I don't feel accepted, when I don't feel I have friends, when I feel less than myself, um, that it makes me vulnerable. So I'm gonna lack some social skills. And a lot of times our kids are brave behind the screen. They can reinvent themselves. Um, you know, sometimes it's through an avatar that I will make friends because they don't really have to see my face or my personality. My avatar can move forward for me. Um, we need to feel connected. So when I'm on YouTube or when I'm building um, my friends on a gaming, I need notoriety. So I'm going to allow anybody to come into my world. If you want to come, I'm going to accept your friend request. And that makes me vulnerable because I do not know how to verify who is requesting my friendship, right? And that need for belonging and that acceptance comes into play. When we ask our kids, what do you wanna be when you grow up? When I was growing up, the answers were princess, teacher, doctor, police officer. Um, and now when we ask our kids, what do you wanna be when you grow up? Nine times out of 10, it's YouTuber or influencer. And a YouTuber and an influencer needs followers. We need um, people to see us. We need people to follow us. And we don't verify who those are. And so what happens is when our kids have that vulnerability, then we bring in these cyberbullying trends and we also bring online predators. These are some of the cyberbullying trends that we have been seeing. So it's not just I got a list from somewhere. These are things that we've actually had kids that we've been working with. Um, to identify these issues. The harassing is the typical calling you names, leaving you messages, things like that, that, that bother you. The trolling happens um, in gaming. There's a, a hacking that happens. There's a trolling phase that shows up and it takes over your game. So if you have been building points, if you had been saving coins or things like that, the trolls come in and they destroy your property and they take your money. The impersonating is people stealing pictures of yours from let's say Facebook, which is very easy to do, and then creating accounts um, with your face on it. Um, we had situations where um, actually an online predator took a picture of, of one of our students and created a profile and was doing like a middle school reunion page. So they were getting all these kids and this student had no idea until someone said, hey, why are you creating this middle school reunion page? and she had no idea her picture was stolen and we had to report it. Um, and the, the tag that was used, the email address that was used was um, also a tag that was used for online trafficking. So we had to alert the school, we had to alert um, uh, law enforcement and let them know that um, this, this uh, profile perhaps could be linked to trying to lure kids um, into some sort of trafficking. So that's that using the photos. Um, a lot of times we have kids now that learn coding at school. They know how to use, um, uh, what is that program? It's a program to alter photos. And so they know how to take pictures and impose them on other pictures and pass those around. That's something that has been around because kids would draw them, but now it's more sophisticated. Um, I have access to tools that I can impose a picture on a picture. Um, creating websites, blogs, blogs, or accounts. So when I was in school, these were called slam books. It was a notebook that people would take and put the name of a person on a page, and then people would write these ugly things and then pass them on to friends and everybody else would comment on them. And you would sign up with a number. You wouldn't sign up with your name. Now it's more sophisticated. You can create that online and people can comment and you know, our victims can look and visit at those websites often. Um, shaming is something that we see with our parents. Um, you know, you've seen the parent that wears the shirt that says my daughter misbehaved, or they send the kid with a shirt um, that the, per the parent put that said, I'm a liar or something like that. And so because we have some parents that have done that, we have students that copy that and do that online shaming. Vague booking is a means that students have started so that they don't get in trouble. Um, it's 
it's about making a comment about something that could apply to anyone. So for example, did you see the girl in the red sweater yesterday? Oh my goodness, didn't it look terrible on her? And red happens to be the color of the school and everybody wears a red sweater. So the victim knows they're talking about them. The victim knows that um, they're doing it on purpose to shame them, but there's no way to prove that's who they were talking about. So it's this vaguing that goes on, you know, oh, the girl with the glasses, I really didn't like her or the girl with the brown hair or the boy with the shorts and everybody wears shorts. It's a means to, it's a form of gaslighting, you know, where the victim does most of the processing, does most of the criticizing and, and the perpetrator is innocent. You know, well, they took it that way. I wasn't even talking about them. And there's no way to hold people accountable. Um, the text bombing are apps that are used for marketing. So you might get an app right now. The famous thing is um, your car warranty is going to go, is going to expire. Please call us so that we can um, update your car warranty and your car, you might not even own the car anymore or you don't have the warranty on the car, but this uh, scamming call keeps coming in on your phone. That's one of the new ones that has been around. It's a marketing tool. So what happens is you can program this app to say, I don't like you a hundred times a day. And the app will send that text to kids and they're hands-free. So the text will come in and the, the perpetrator will be like, well, I don't even have my phone today. That's not even my number. Look, a text just came in. You know, that doesn't have anything to do with me. So. It's important that we know our kids' phones and that we know what apps we have on them and what people are using. The deep faking is something that came uh, with apps that are called refacing. Um, basically, it's um, imposing your face on a movie scene. So I had, when it first came out, I put my face on Selena's body and I did one of her concerts in, in this virtual, you know, kind of jokey kind of thing. There was a guy who did a really great uh, Tom Cruise impersonation. And so he did the mannerisms and he put Tom Cruise's face on him and it looks like Tom Cruise is doing it, but it's an impersonator. So we have these apps that are meant for fun and kids are using them to reimpose them doing inappropriate things. So they might put the face on someone that's smoking. They might put their face on someone that's doing something um, sexually exploitive. Um, and so I know that there's an actress whose face was used for pornography in this app, and she's a huge advocate um, for it, uh, to get it, you know, taken off, uh, because it is a form of identity theft. So these are some of the things that are happening um, in our cyber world with our kids. We have had even um, people stealing uh, addresses online. So I can take a picture um, from Facebook if, if it's not if the geo code is still on there, which you should check your phones often, look at your camera settings and you wanna take off all geo coding. Um, don't leave a location tag on it. So the number one place where kids love to take pictures, the bathroom, the bathroom in your home. You know, especially our girls, uh, they'll go in the bathroom where it's private and they'll selfie themselves um, and then they'll uh, upload that picture. So you're giving me your address by taking that picture with your geo tags on. So we have had um, individuals this summer where they took that picture, they found the geolocation, um, they give the latitude and longitude of it on the photo, it's, it's in the properties of the photo, you put that on Google Maps and it gives you the address. Um, so they would create fake accounts and they would say, if you have a problem with me, this is my address, I'll see you here at two o'clock. And so that was a threat that was, uh, law enforcement had to be involved because you are stealing identities and addresses and creating situations that are threatening to the family. So it's important for us to be aware of these kinds of things and um, that our kids feel like they're safe behind the screen and they're not. They really need to be educated on um, how to use their phones, how to use their electronics safely. Um, we know that currently trending um, kids that are being bullied are um, kids with racial backgrounds like um, Islamic backgrounds, um, kids that have religious backgrounds, 
um, our LGBTQ community, and sadly our disabilities community because we, we don't have the skills to respond socially because we have limitations, um, because we, are, we don't understand uh, how to explain ourselves or we're slower. There's an intolerance for our disabilities communities um, and they need the help to speak to administrators about making sure that they go to school in a safe environment. We have a lot of kids in, in our disabilities communities that seek our support and that we're happy to help to make sure that they go to school um, to learn and to, to get the benefits of, of their educational um, experience. Um, with Back Lives Matter, with AAPI Hate, with our Asian community, our DACA and immigration, and our Armenian genocide um, issues that are happening, we have had more calls in regards to these areas. So we know that bullying is a public health concern. We know that we need everybody's support to help um, rid ourselves of bullying in our schools. It's not something that should be tolerated. It's something that moves on to other situations. Kids who learn power and control dynamics um, usually get into um, domestic violence situations when they're older, um, teen dating violence. Um, we know that kids who are bullying um, and have these behaviors um, who don't get the support tend to have substance abuse issues, drop out of school, they vandalize, they might join gangs. Um, and so again, contributing to our, our, our public safety um, concerns. And of course, our bystanders, they suffer the most when something happens to the victim. So when the victim um, becomes suicidal, uh, when uh, they have uh, been attacked, the bystanders tend to feel that guilt and that shame of not being able to support. And that guilt and that shame might show up in anxiety and depression and health issues, um, isolation, poor academic performance. Um, so we know that bullying is something that needs to be addressed because it impacts us all. Again, we're talking about just those perpetrators um, and how to know if my kid has become vulnerable um, and what needs to happen. So when, you, when your kids are spending a lot of time online, it's important to go into their accounts, into their worlds and see who are these people and ask, who is J123? How did you know um, Lauren Baby? How did you become friends with um, Guppy 504? Um, we need to know who these people are talking to. Is this a friend from school? Where did you meet this person? We need to ask those questions. So these are some signs to look for um, to see if your child has been targeted by an online predator. One, that they spend a lot of time online and it's not just gaming with friends. Who are you talking to? What kind of things um, are you interacting with online? If you find pornography on the computer or the phone, our online predators seek females for um, human trafficking or sex trafficking, and they seek our young boys for exposure to pornography. Those tend to be the two main things. And so we need to see if we see these things, where did it come from, who's giving it to you, those kinds of things. Strange phone calls, they're unknown or they're long distance or they're calling at strange hours. Um, a lot of times these online predators are not local. Um, they might be from other countries or other states and they're trying to lure kids um, into getting on a bus or um, getting on a, a, a train or something like that to transport students. They can be very local um, as well. So we also have to know that um, uh, the trafficking of children happens here in the US more than in other countries. If you are receiving gifts or packages or mail, if it's arriving to your house in your child's name and they don't have a credit card and you don't know where it's coming from. So what happens is a lot of our kids go on YouTube and they'll you know, talk about whatever game they're playing or whatnot. And so a fan might, send, might have stolen a picture, got the address and sends a package. The child receives the package and on their next you know, blog on YouTube, Hey, thank you, John124. I got your package and I like the product 
and I appreciate you sending it to me. And the kid is unaware that you that they just confirmed their address. You know, um, it was a check to see if that was the right address. And so you're confirming with your interaction in giving the thanks for what you received. So it's important to look at what's coming into the house. Um, if they're withdrawing from usual activities and interests. So I used to like hanging out with my cousins and now I don't go. I used to like being part of the baseball team and now I don't wanna play. Um, and in place of that is some, side, some sort of online um, interaction. If they close electronics quickly, uh, if they close them quickly when you're coming by, um, if they turn their phones around, um, if they hide in their pockets, or they can't be away from the phone, or they can't be away from the computer, like they're waiting for someone to come and speak to them or so on. Um, I strongly believe that like dinner time is not electronic time. Um, when you're, I believe electronics are for emergency uses. So when you're home, you don't need that electronic near you. Um, you're at home. It's important to give our kids breaks from their electronics. Um, there was a study that was done where kids said that they would rather lose their sense of smell than their electronic or their internet time. Um, so when we have had cyberbullying, one of the things that we do with them is taking breaks from being online. And that has been a challenge. Kids cannot separate themselves from their electronics. So look at those types of behavior. Um, using other accounts or someone else's. Um, an online predator might say, hey, look, you don't have all these. So let me give you my username and let me give you um, the password. And instead of using your own, use mine. There are tons of apps that we need to be, excuse me, that we need to be aware of online where um, they, it's called a, a mask. So they can turn it on. And when you're going through it, you can use the phone at its regular um, function, but when you leave, they take the mask off and it unveils all the other apps that they have on there. Um, so um, there is a book out there called Parenting in the Digital World. I highly recommend it. It's a step-by-step -step, um, app. Um, it tells you what apps are dangerous to your kids and it gives you a step-by-step -step process of how to find it on the phone and how to take it off. Um, so it's a great book and he also has um, a website that um, you can go through and he gives you, um, he's, a, he's an online parent enforcer or something. He, he tries to do the parenting thing for other parents when their kids are online. Um, and then when they keep relationships a secret, um, when you don't know the relationships that the kids are having online. These are all the California laws and policies. Um, all these laws um, and policies tell us about how to work with our kids, what our rights are, what we should do, how we support. Um, and so when we feel like we're not protected or nothing's out there, if this is just at a glance. I'm not gonna go through all of these. I know all of these because of the work that we do, but we do have laws and policies that protect us and we do have those rights. Um, the book name again is um, Parenting in the Digital World. And I believe it's Michael Clayton that uh, wrote that book. I'll look it up and put it in the chat box. Sure. Thank you, I appreciate uh -huh. that. Parenting My partner is not here world. today. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she's, um, she's due at any minute. So she's, um, she usually does all that stuff. So thank you, okay. I appreciate <laughs> mm -hmm. that. Um, yeah, so these are just those policies and procedures that have to happen. Seth's law is one that we really have to know because this one helps us out. Seth unfortunately lost his life uh, to suicide um, uh, because of the bullying that was going on at school. And as a result, the family worked really hard to enforce these laws for us um, here in California that tell us about um, that the schools must adopt a strong anti-bullying policy. It has to specifically spell out prohibited, prohibited basis for bullying, which includes sexual orientation and gender identity and gender expression. Um, we need to adopt a specific process for receiving and investigating complaints of bullying, including a requirement that school personnel intervene if they witness bullying. In addition to this, 
school personnel has to be trained in how to recognize and respond to bullying. Um, there has to be a publicized anti-bullying policy and complaint process. It should be in your student handbook. It should be posted on the walls in your office. The kids should have access to it. It should be on the website and the district must also publicly uh, post these policies. Again, it has to be on the district website. So when you go to the school, it should not be a question about what is the bullying policy. You should know it because it's visible to you and it's already been presented to you. Um, you can even ask when the last bullying training was for your school. Um, and so this really helps us make sure that our kids are in an environment with adults that are going to respond to bullying. Jordan's law is specific to recording, particularly in our middle schools, we have kids that have fights on campus and they like to record them and they post them to receive notoriety or credit um, for the fight. Um, I see a question, thank you. Um, so we want to make sure that kids know if you are recording for purposes of distribution or gaining attention, you could be seen as an accomplice to that crime. So Jordan was at a Burger King and he was minding his own business, having his lunch. And there was a group of, of kids outside the Burger King who wanted to film a fight. So they chose Jordan and when Jordan came out, they attacked him. So the person who attacked him um, received uh penalties for the assault jordan survived the attack um but him and his dad were not satisfied with just the person that committed the um attack there were other people there that could have called 911 that could have asked for help that could have intervened and they did not instead they pulled out their cameras and they took photos and videos and they were heckling and laughing and then posted it on social media so Jordan's law um, looks at what happened with that video that you took. If you're going to take videos of a situation, it must be for purposes to help the victim, not for your notoriety. It is so that you can provide it to the victim for um, them if they're going to do a prosecute a case or if they need it uh, for some reason or you know, you're trying to support. Anything other than that, um, could make you an accomplice. Uh, we are looking at virtual versus real presence things. Um, because we live in a virtual world, because our kids navigate more in a virtual world, um, the virtual and the real seem to be the same. Um, this is a situation with Conrad and Michelle Carter, um, where Michelle coached him on how to um, commit suicide. Um, and so she provided a means, she provided a plan, she was coaching him through it. And so she was seen um, as um, she got involuntary manslaughter for gaining notoriety after he passed away. So as the girlfriend, she received a lot of attention. Um, and it turns out that she had provided more than 2000 texts. Um, he was in contact with her during his um, suicide attempt and she coached and made sure that he fulfilled his promise to end his life. So we are starting to move into a world where virtual and real kind of are the same thing. This is happening in Massachusetts. And as soon as this is done, I, I can see it trickling down to other states um, where people will be seen culpable um, for their uh, involvement. The latest cyberbullying law that we had um, the update was in 2019. So um, when the children are physically bullying each other, they're in each other's presence at school, the school can um, take action. When it happens outside of their school or it happens in a virtual world outside of their um, scope, they, there was not much that they could do. In 2019, that changed. If the kids are gonna return to school and there's a potential for the problem to continue in school, then schools can and should intervene um, in this online bullying, the cyberbullying that happens at school. So now schools have to address um, cyberbullying at the school if it's impacting them there as well. And then the California Safe Place to Learn Act 
is reinforcing that there should be protection for everybody online or on campus, even off campus, if it's gonna come back to school and support. Bullying is such a big issue for us and it, we cannot expect the school to take care of it on their own. And we cannot expect parents to take care of it on their own. And we cannot expect that it happens only in our community. We need to work together to make sure that bullying is not okay on campus, off campus, in my park, in my home, in my community, um, and not in my school. We also need to support our school staff. We need to support our principals with these issues um, so that we can together um, rid ourselves of the situation. You need to know your rights. This is something that is guaranteed to you. You have a right to a safe env environment and an education. You have a right to send your child to school and make sure that they come back in a safe manner. That's your right. You have a right to be heard. You have a right to tell your story. And I tell parents all the time, do not tell school personnel that you have a problem in between classes, in between meetings, when they're watching the yard because they don't have that attention for you. You need to request a meeting in writing to ensure that you get that time that you deserve to be heard um, about your complaint, about what's been going on, and you have a right to support. You have a right to have the bullying behavior end. You have a right that the school respond to your concern, that they address the concern, and that there is a plan in place that is written in specific so that your child can go to school and learn. And you have a right to choose, a right to decide how you want to be helped. So one of the things that I find challenging for my, the kids that I support that have been victim of bullying is that when they report bullying, the first thing that we wanna do is get the bully in the room and we're gonna confront each other on what's happening. As a mental health counselor, I recognize that that child might not be ready for that step. That might have taken them a lot to report the bullying and they're so fearful of having to face the perpetrator or the child with the bullying behavior because they're afraid of the retaliation. So the child has a right to say, I don't want to face my bully. You can tell the bully what I've been going through, but I don't want to have another fight with this person. I just want this to end. So we have a right to say, this is how I want to be supported. Um, a lot of our parents want to do parent and parent conferences so that we can face each other and talk about what our kids are going. But we have to remember that these are minors and that might not be the safest thing for us to do. So we have to also look at what is in our possibilities. Um, we, but we do have a right to that support and we do have a right to that choice. So those are four things that everybody has a right to, whether you have, whether you're, uh, have, whether you're undocumented or documented or, you know, it's a right that everybody has um, for us to be able to exercise them. So we need help in responding. We need to make sure that we know how to recognize bullying, how to understand if a child is in trouble, if our child is in trouble. We have to know how to respond to these situations. And when they're not safe, we have to know how to report. Do you know where the bullying complaint form is at your school? Do you know who the um, administrator responsible for receiving those reports is? Do you know where to get a report? Um, and so, we, this is how we can help end these bullying situations if we're able to do that. We have um, issues with us as bystanders when we witness bullying, when we go to school and it may not be our child and we may not know this other person. And so we just say, well, I hope their parents take care of it, right? We have to make sure that we offer the support by letting a teacher or somebody know, look, I just passed by there and this kid said this to this. I think that child needs help. Or call our hotline and say, I witnessed this at this school. I don't know who this kid is, but they need more um, supervision in this part of the school or outside in this area um, so that we can help the schools and let them know where uh, potentially these challenges are. So recognize, respond, and report. And if you want to go a little bit further, um, there is bystander intervention. Um, that you can take trainings on, but um, they train in this area. So basically, 
um, you want to direct. Um, you want to, if you're an adult and you feel comfortable going to a child saying, hey, I heard that. Sometimes that's all it takes. Um, no, that doesn't sound right. Are you getting picked up now? Where are you supposed to be? A short sentence to redirect the child and let them know there's an adult nearby. Sometimes that one phrase is all that it does um, to direct a child to a different way. Um, and we can be direct in how we feel. I didn't like the way that sounded. You know, oh, I heard that. That wasn't very kind. It's not acceptable. Um, and the direct is also letting um, them know that it checks them, right? Like, oh, what I said was not correct and somebody heard me. And sometimes that derails them and makes them stop, right? Delegating is reporting. It is saying, um, look, teacher, look, Mrs. Smith, um, I heard this outside. I don't know who this child is, but that was that didn't seem safe to me. You know, use your feelings about it. It made me really uncomfortable to hear that. Or, you know, that delegates it to somebody else. Um, you, you are sure that you notified somebody. So if something were to happen to the kid, well, I told Mrs. Smith several times how that made me feel. We can have accountability when we are able to delegate. Distracting um, is something that we tell our kids to do, right? So if there's a bullying happening or, or there's something happening in the playground, um, hey, the basketball court just became available. You wanna go play? Oh, I forgot my backpack. Will you come with me? It's a distraction. It, it, takes away from whatever the conflict was, right? Um, one kid suggested that they would fall and see if they would pay attention to them, right? So we're looking for something that's nonviolent that will take the attention away. Um, delaying is something like, we know there's gonna be a fight at three o'clock and the student will say, um, oh, I forgot my book. Will you go with me to go get my book? And then they go the opposite way and they delay the time or they don't leave the classroom until after everybody has left, or they leave ahead of time. It's a way to delay time, to give more of a cooling off period, to give more of an opportunity for um, something else to happen. You know, maybe an adult will get there um, at 3.15 and not at three o'clock. So they'll wait until 3.15 because there's an adult there. So that delay is also a strategy that we teach. And then of course, document. You want to document the day, the time, who you saw, what they were wearing, where they came from, and any incident with your children should be in writing. You want to give um, your school something in writing because that, if, if, it didn't, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. It's kind of the rule. But if you wrote it down and you gave it to the principal and you, you, you formally wrote something, then they have to investigate. They have to give it attention. They have to file it. They have to be, there has to be something there. Um, for them to respond to. So that's a little bit about bystander intervention and some of the things that you can do. You can also call us if you're not sure what to do. Call us and say, you know, I was at school and I saw this and it bothered me. And then we can tell you what to do or we can report it for you. Or if it happened to your child, we work with the kids too. We do a lot of resiliency education and, and talk about their strengths and their plans and their strategies and how they can move forward, right? We don't want you to do any of this alone. We want you to call us. We wanna build a relationship with you. We want you to trust us. We want you to know that there's support out there. Um, we wanna support you when you call us and we work collaboratively, it alleviates the stress and the anxiety of not knowing how to handle it, not knowing what to do. You're, you're taking us in with you and we know what should happen. We know the laws about it. We know how to help advocate. We know how to bring the community together. And so a lot of times, Parents feel more supported that way. We've been called by schools also when they haven't been able to get the families to work together or communicate or collaborate. We come in as an uninterested party that just wants to help the situation. We understand the process. This is what we do. And again, our services are completely free. We don't need a Medi-Cal or we don't need um, any type of income verification. Um, we are here to support you. We have a partnership with Ellie versus Hate and 211. Bullying can be a hate crime. The bullying could be um, related to, again, a disability, being part of the LGBTQ community, your religious um, background, your, um, your heritage. Um, it could have a component that might 
um, be a reason that the bullying is happening because of hate. You can report things to LA versus hate as well, just by count, by counting, uh, by calling 211. So you call 211, let them know you want to report a hate um, incident, and they keep track. One of the things that we want to do is keep track of how much bullying is happening in our schools. And right now, those are internal um, numbers. We wouldn't know, but when we report it to 211, we get a better sense of what's happening in our schools and in our community. So um, this is a really good partnership for us. And they usually link you to one of our services. So if you call 211 and you, they wanna link you to us, it's usually an easy um, handoff. This is our call to action. We have kids that we support, but they will not join our online communities officially because they don't want the bully to have a trace to them. That doesn't mean they don't see the post. That doesn't mean they don't look at our community con comments. And so the more people are on our online communities, um, our kids see that there's support. Our kids see that um, people care and they have their own opinions. And, and all of our, our um, social media is interactive. So it's usually a question that we pose and we want people's um, opinions about it. So follow us, like, share, or comment. And again, these are hashtags that you could um, connect to us too. And that's what I have. Um, questions, comments, concerns. Thank you so much, Karen. Yeah, if anyone's out there that has a question for Karen, you can put it in the chat box or um, you definitely have the information. I, we thank you for being here. Um, so we'll give you a few minutes if you have any um, if you have any questions for. Her. Wendy, did you have any questions? I, I think I, I saw a request earlier, but I could I could just been. You said what was that, Karen? I, I thought I saw Wendy with the request to talk, but I didn't. Uh, I oh. don't know if that was me or that was her. Let me just see. I don't see. I don't see any names. It's in the attendees. Yeah. Well, let's see. Yeah, I, that's, that's in participants. Um, well, I guess everyone, thank you so much. Um, you know where to get in touch with Karen. You know where to get in touch with the Family Focus Resource Center. Now I see Wendy's name. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and this will also um, be on our on our YouTube channel. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording. So.